Hey everybody, my name is Kyla. Welcome to my channel where I talk about the stock market and the economy amongst other things. Today I'm going to be talking about hypertakeflation, the sportification of the Federal Reserve, and meme stocks, of course. It's really going to be kind of a qualitative review, but then also talking about the more quantitative aspect of it and why this stuff is important for the overall functioning of the markets. So in order to be the most insufferable YouTube video in the whole world, I'm going <laughs> to quote Nietzsche to begin. The men of corruption are witty and slanderous. They know of types of murder that require neither degrees nor assault. They know that whatever is said well is to be believed. Whatever is said well is to be believed. That's sort of the impetus of this whole piece, whatever is said well is to be believed whatever is neat and tidy even if it's wrong or blatantly sensationalized people are going to listen to that casino markets the meme stonk printer is running again why who really knows things are happening you might as well bet 25 million dollars on bed bath and beyond the impact of this is kind of funny because the financial industry prides himself on being like this very serious <laughs> very intense industry and meme stonks have pointed out the inherent unseriousness of some of the aspects of this that's kind of a gross generalization but for illustrative purposes. Meme stonks essentially say we're going to pump the most ridiculous stocks on this market and make money. There is some institutional play being done in the meme stock arena for sure, but it's pretty wild to watch things like AMC, GME, Bed Bath & Beyond catch a bid basically because of the idea of number go up. The meme stock phenomenon really accomplishes two main things. Number one, the market is not real. The existence of meme stonks can make the stock market feel like a very fake thing. And of course, companies make money that's reflected in market cap. There is real money involved, etc. But when stocks completely break from any fundamental value, it definitely requires some sort of gut check that usually ends with a question mark. And then part number two, financial conditions are disconnected from economic reality. The Fed uses financial conditions like the stock market, beam stonks, as a transmission mechanism for the impact of monetary policy. If AMC is mooning, the Fed is probably not going to feel super great about how their tightening path looks. As Jonathan Levin points out, to meaningfully cool consumer demand, the Fed might need to engineer a sentiment shift. And that's where stocks come in. Stocks are the most visible feature of US financial markets markets, and they have a significant impact on the way Americans feel about the outlook. But of course, markets are real. Retail sales came in flattish this week, and we see that the consumer is still spending money, driven by more price versus volume things, as they try to budget against inflation. But that's a big disconnect from some of the market moves that we've seen, right? Going back to the concept of the vibe session, there's a gap between reality and vibe. All of this contributes to the idea of markets as entertainment. People go to this casino to gamble, but they also go to have fun. It's really similar with markets. People invest to make money but also somehow it's, it has become this like community oriented experience which people use as a form of entertainment. So markets as entertainment. When people are able to watch something from afar and make bets, monetary or not, on what happens, that is entertainment. Sports are entertainment. The Federal Reserve has become entertainment. Data releases have become entertainment. And there's a gamification part of finance that Robinhood and other social investing apps have contributed to, but arguably there's also a partification aspect of it too. Financial data releases have become big events. This sounds pretty ridiculous to say out loud, but that is the overall sentiment. Fed meeting days are almost like the Super Bowl, especially now that there is uncertainty around 50 bips, 75 bips, pausing, etc. People watch the movements of speakers like they would their favorite sports players. It's great that people are interested in the markets, but there are two core points here. Number one, Fed credibility reduction. People treating the Fed as a game or something that is consumable content might work to reduce Fed credibility. There are real world consequences to what the Fed does. Raising rates and shrinking a balance sheet does show up in our real lives, the housing market is the clearest example of that right now. But if the Fed themselves becomes content, which I think they have become with the increased amount of Fed speak that happens between meetings, that reduces their overall credibility because it's saturation and distraction. One thing that people tell you about making your own content is you have to be almost unique in your takes and you can't saturate it with uh, conflicting opinions because then people aren't going to believe you as a newsletter writer, as a YouTuber, whatever. The Fed is not listening to that core tenant of content creation. Creation. The point number two is the need for big takes. When the Fed saturates the take market with their own sometimes contradictory takes, that creates a lot of confusion. So when things as obscure as economic data releases like the CPI become things to rally around to have like a very big take on, that creates skewed incentives for those said takes. People want to understand, so they just oftentimes listen to whoever is screaming the loudest. That is often Irma Bear style people who are extremely negative and just like not maybe who you want to be listening to because it's sensationalized and they're usually 
usually selling some sort of product or some sort of course. This applies to more than just the Fed. So the government passed the Inflation Reduction Act this week, which Hank Green has a good thread on. And most of the responses that I got on my TikTok about it were spending leads to inflation and also that I'm a CIA agent. There is no concept of future, no concept of investment because we have turned everything into A plus B equals Z. When in reality, it's much more of A plus B minus Y squared plus three equals Z. There's a desire for simplification and very big takes provide that. And that gets into this concept of takeflation, hypertakeflation and the power of doomerism. Take inflation as part of the Fed's monetary policy toolkit, which is why this tweet from Internet Hippo is modern philosophy. The reason you're seeing increasingly batched opinions on here is due to a phenomenon called take inflation. All the regular takes have already been posted, so each subsequent generation of takes has to outdo the previous one. The Fed released their minutes this week, and it was essentially like, yeah, we're going to keep on hiking rates and checking out the data. A lower gas prices are not enough for us. And then the day after the minutes were released, there was an onslaught of speakers with very, very big takes. And I get it. The Fed wants to direct the market to where they think it needs to go. But right now it's a game of chicken. The Federal Reserve is squaring up against the market, but somebody's going to have to swerve first because otherwise the cars are going to run into each other. And so this is sort of complicated. The thing is, if the Fed does swerve first and starts cutting rates, the market did not win. As Modest Proposal points out, if the Fed switches from raising rates to cutting, that likely means something is broken entirely, which is not good. There's also a disconnect between what the Fed is doing and what the market thinks the Fed is doing, as Daria Perkins pointed out. For the Fed, slowing down is slowing down rate hikes, but the market expects rate cuts. There's a gap between expectations and reality, which creates this perfect storm of very big takes. Supply side information issues compounded by printing too many takes has created this hyper takeflationary environment. So we talk about hyperinflation, we talk about inflation raging, I think takes are raging. Hyper takeflation is essentially you have to scream louder into the void to be heard. If you aren't hearing your own echo rattle around, well, you better turn it up a notch and get some eyes on you. As Talman highlights, this could be driven by something more cynical, driven by trades, of course, and wanting to be right on bearish macro calls. The problem is when bad news and bad takes begin to drive the overall narrative, that's when things devolve into harmful rhetoric and misleading information, which impacts expectations and outcomes and isn't reflected of reality. It's much easier to say things are bad and you should be mad versus saying things are okay-ish and that is okay. NVER talked about this in a recent paper, uh, stories which attribute outcomes to causes have stronger effects than statistical information. We show that factual statistical information does not eliminate the power of causal narratives. Rhetoric exists. Ben has a good series of tweets on how the extrapolation of narratives specifically around theories applies to the finance industry and wrote an entire piece for no opinion about it. But take inflation rewards these very big takes because they're sort of the inflammatory narrative, right? It's something to be loud about. Hyper takeflation takes hold. This gets into the sportification of the Federal Reserve. This gets into the metagame. People love watching sports. It's a big hobby for many. Tailgates, parties, apparel, you pick a team, usually something that's in your city, and you become sometimes a very passionate and devoted fan for this team. But there are a few key parts to the passionate and devoted fan. Put me in, coach. The passionate and devoted fan often thinks of themselves as very good at whatever sport they're watching, or at least better than those currently playing. Run the ball, the fan thinks that they would know exactly what to do in every situation and that they would do a very, very good job of it at all times. Oh yeah, they're hurt, so kind of cheering for people to get hurt. And that is my team. The passionate and devoted fan ties up a lot of who they are into the identity of that team. Sports don't exist without fans. Someone has to buy the tickets. It's similar to the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve wouldn't exist without the economy, which is people peopling. But this passionate and devoted fan behavior is showing up in markets and this like hyper takeflation about what the Fed does. So they need to cut rates now. It's all money supply. I want a recession. I have my entire identity tied up in my portfolio. None of these armchair takes are good or bad, but it's the vibes that they drive that mattered the most. The noisiness of very big takes could erode the Fed's credibility. So most of all, it's just really interesting. So circling back to Jonathan's point, the Fed might need to engineer a sentiment shift. The Fed might need to engineer a sentiment shift around themselves too. So final thoughts. Things are improving, but hypertakeflation doesn't really reward that, right? We are seeing recovering things like chicken wing prices. People feel secure in their jobs. But an alarming number of people think that we're already in a recession. Bill and Skanda have been tweeting out a lot of positive news about the markets, the fall in used cars prices and how that's going to help, the strength in subprime auto loans, gas prices are continuing to hit new lows, stronger employment income indicators, healthy credit card balances, even though they are increasing, domestic production of paint coatings and adhesives, agricultural machinery, multifamily completions are ticking up. But I think although the data is improving, this the inputs themselves might be worsening. So this is like kind of beyond the current 
moment. There's a great video that Nicole shared on how the Delaware Aqueduct got built and it's a really great water system. But as Anthony Lee Zhang highlighted, as resources get cheaper, we find progressively dumber uses of them. Like would we be able to build the Delaware Aqueduct? that's a hard word, the Delaware Aqueduct today. And zooming out even more, what are we able to build today? As Shannon Valor discussed how tech companies don't pay attention to user need anymore, the saddest thing for me about modern tech's long spiral into user manipulation and surveillance is how it has slowly killed off the joy that people like me used to feel about new tech. Every product that Meta or Amazon announces makes the future seem bleaker and grayer. I think a derivative of this shows up in the whole Adam Newman flow A16Z thing too, for however you feel about Newman. He did build WeWork, he is a character, he does have 3,000 rental properties. It's kind of like, oh man, like here's this guy getting a huge freaking check from A6 $350 million. And he, <laughs> whoa. Whoa. The private markets are inherently more gamified than public markets because it definitely is like a little network game. Who knows who? It's a wild west of capital allocation, but it almost feels very dismissive of the very real problem of the housing crisis to be like, don't worry, we're going to give it to the WeWork guy. He's going to solve it. Like it just feels icky. As Mac Conwell said, there in times of economic downturn, allocators turn back to what they deem is safer. That's right. You'd get far faster for investing in underrepresented founders than investing in Adam Newman from WeWork fame and with a giant check too. I don't know. Uh, you just kind of have to respond to the data as it comes, which is what the Fed is doing. However, what is said well is to be believed. And that's why it's so important to sprinkle in a bit of optimism here and there. As Shirley Wang wrote in Sports Complex, the science behind fanatic behavior, sports fans are so resilient because they can hope. So you can find this piece on Substack, I'm on Instagram, I'm on TikTok, uh, YouTube, everywhere, LinkedIn. Yeah, but I hope that you all are doing okay and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.